show up soon. He was picking up some water, I think. Yeah. Yesterday we discussed a lot. Oh, sorry, I have to start this one, I think. Yeah, it's uh, slowly coming up on the overhead. And there is a message as well. 500 hours have passed since last filter check. Maintenance of the filter is absolutely necessary to remove this warning message. But it's still... It you see, this is... Yeah. Okay, yesterday we discussed load sizing. A load size problem is a production planning problem or a kind of shorter horizon than the aggregate production planning problem. In the aggregate production planning problem, we focus on a kind of intermediate time period, typically a year, and the decisions we focus on then are related to rough production estimates, rough inventory estimates, and, uh, and, and mainly these hire and fire or work force decisions. So that kind of sets uh, a space for a more detailed production planning. And so now we kind of move one step closer into the logistics scene and look at production planning, which is limited typically to a month or even a week. And the main forces in a lot sizing problem are inventory costs and setup costs. So these are the two cost elements we balance. And the idea, as always, is to minimize total costs, and the total costs are kind of uh, put together by the setup costs and the inventory costs. We have already discussed inventory costs, so, uh, and yesterday we, we said that the setup costs is related to setups, meaning that we start something or stop something. Uh, in many situations, setup costs are far more complex than the one we looked at yesterday. Because yesterday we had no sequence dependency. This sequence dependency problem occurs when you have more than one product. So if you, for instance, have two products on a single machine, it could be that the costs involved in making your setup or preparing your machine for a new production line depends on the sequence of the products. A classical example here, if you produce soft drinks and you have a machine, you put water into it and you put carbon dioxide into it and you put some taste into it, then of course you can get uh, soda, you can get uh, various kinds of Coca-Cola and everything out of this machine, can't you? If you know the recipe. But if you start producing Coca-Cola and you want to produce something else afterwards, some kind of water for instance, then you will have to wash the machine. This washing takes time, but it also obviously imposes and hence uh, imposes cost on the production. So <coughs> this sequence dependency problem in lot sizing is, uh, is difficult, but we will not discuss that much. So the example we looked at yesterday had no sequence dependency, obviously, as it was only a single product. So the problem then was kind of just to decide how much to produce, when you produce. That was the point. And this concept a lot is related to this. Okay? A lot is kind of how much do I produce now before I stop production for a certain amount of pairs and then I start producing again for another lot. So these lots kind of defined the amount I produce each time I produce. And as we discussed yesterday, I think it's a fruitful way of thinking about this, is thinking like this, okay, today I produce. Either I produce for today or I produce for today as well as tomorrow, or I produce for today and tomorrow and the day after and so on. So this lot kind of is fixed together of a certain amount of demand numbers. Okay, we kind of add demands. Either we, we use the demand for today or the demand for today plus tomorrow and so on. So this is kind of named as producing whole period needs. So producing whole periods need, period needs means that we kind of don't look into the space in between. So we never kind of produce half of what we need tomorrow. If we 
decide to produce for tomorrow, obviously we produce for tomorrow. Because then if we, if we only produce half we need tomorrow, then we have to take an extra set of tomorrow, which we can avoid. Of course we save a little on, on the inventory, but typically that is, uh, is, is, is not uh, sensible. So yesterday we discussed basically two methods for approaching a solution for this problem. And we first looked at the so-called lot for lot strategy, which means that you produce the demand. There was a lot of different names on this lot for lot strategy, chase demand, zero inventory strategy, and so on. So there's a lot of names on this sim pos simplest possible way of producing, basically, meaning that you do not need to think about inventory because you produce what your customer would like. There are other reasons for that being an interesting strategy than this part. Because the problems we look at here, we assume they are de deterministic, so there are no uncertainty. If there is high uncertainty on future demand, obviously we kind of risk something if we fill up our inventory. Do you agree? Especially if there's a downside risk here. So we, we, we are not, it, it may be that we are not able to sell the amount we have in inventory. Of course, that is a bad thing. So then the slot for lot strat strategy becomes more nice, doesn't it? Because then you can. Uh, just meet the demand and you can kind of observe what's happening as you pr produce. So in, a, in an uncertainty perspective, this lot for lot strategy is interesting by itself. And much uh, of uh, logistics talk about uh, just in time and, uh, and uh, all these words are uh, related to a bit more complex way of looking at things. But we will return to that, okay? For the moment, we kind of stick to the deterministic modes. And in this case, it's a very simple trade-off between producing a lot today, meaning that we have to put a lot in inventory to meet future demand, or alternatively, produce a little today, but then we'll have to produce a lot tomorrow, keeping up with a high uh, total cost on the setup part. So we discussed this EOQ approximation, which is a very, very simple way of using the EOQ formula. The only thing we needed basically was to kind of compute average demand over the period we looked, enter that into the standard EOQ formula, uh, together with the other necessary parameters, typically the setup cost and the inventory cost, that produces a value, which then we can use as a stepping stone for constructing our production plan. In the example we looked at yesterday, we kind of produced this number to be 139, and then we kind of adopted a production plan based on this. 139. Then, uh, then typically, uh, as opposed to the traditional way of using EOQ, of course we don't get necessarily the same intervals in between the order or the production start. So we get uh, different time periods, so we kind of utilize the fact that, uh, that demand actually varies and we don't need to produce the same, we, we, we choose to produce the same amount, but we don't need to have the same time spacing in between these amounts, which is the typical case in classical EOQ use. And when we looked, uh, what we did then was that we looked at an example where we kind of started out with a lot for lot and it had a certain cost, 1320 I seem to recall, and then we looked at the EOQ approximation which had something around 900 in cost, so it was kind of a substantial change in cost here when moving from the lot for lot to the EOQ approximation. And we also discussed the fact that this EOQ approximation could actually be much better than it was in the example we looked at, due to the fact that the example was kind of exaggerated on the, on the spread of the demands. There was a very small demand of 12 and a very big one on 112, because that is a big change. Uh, a factor of 10 in the demand change is kind of unusual in practice. So in most cases, or at least in many cases, demand does not vary that much. And, and hence, that's the, that would favor this EOQ approximation, ma making it better. In the sense meaning that you're closer to the optimal solution when you use this heuristic or approximative method. Then we looked at this silver and mill heuristic, which explicitly takes into account that you have a varying demand. So this, you would expect that if you have a very variable demand, the silver and mill heuristic should perform well. And it did in our case. It kind of lowered the cost even more. So I don't we were down to 650 or something, actually, I think moving from 900 something down to 650 something, which is a great save. So uh, we ended up yesterday saying, okay, what next? What next then would be to kind of look for the optimal solution, 
to, to kind of guarantee the optimal solution, but to do that, we need to formulate a new linear programming model. This is a different one from the one we looked at in the aggregate planning case, and it has a special element in it which makes it very different. And that is the reason why I kind of spend some time on these matters, because this special element will prove to be relevant when we move on. And the special element it has is the so-called binary variable. A binary variable is a variable who either is 0 or 1, as you would expect. And we can use this binary variable to produce logic when we model. Suppose we're in interested in making decisions related to when to start a certain oil field outside here. Okay. And then we could construct a variable. We often use uh, this Greek delta, at least for the first set of binary variables. Let's stick to that. We can say that delta is 1, and we can put a t on delta, is 1 if this oil field starts in period t. Okay? And it's 0 elsewhere. Now, if you think about our problem here, there is today, there is 2013, we can start it next year, 2014 or 215 and so on, okay? So we, we introduce many new variables here. There is one here, delta 213, if you can start it now, there's another one here, delta 215, there's of course one here as well, delta 214, and so on. All these variables need to be, be given a name. And by this construction, we're kind of able to to kind of pinpoint at a point in time where this project should start. But we have to add some logic, don't we? You could, for instance, say that if we sum together these deltas, overall interesting t's, we could say something like this, or we could say something like this. What would be, what would be the meaning of this construction based on this definition? Are you able to see that? I add all together and I say that the sum should equal 1. What is the meaning of this? Start in the end. Should it start in the end? It doesn't have to be like that. If you look at, we, we can say we have delta 1 then, plus delta 2, plus delta 3. If you just look at three possible years, and I don't write this to make it easier, and we put that equal to 1. What kind of combinations are possible here? Obviously, this one is impossible, isn't it? Because 0 plus 0 plus 0 is, is 0, so that doesn't work, okay? That's not allowed. Is this one allowed? No, no that's 2, okay? So you see what's happening here is that we kind of pick one year to start it, which obviously is logical. If you start one, you can't start it twice, okay? So this one will secure that your old field actually starts. What about this one? Minus. No, there is not allowed with minus here, okay? The value is either 1 or 0, nothing else. In this case, what about this one? Is this one allowed? Yes. It is, isn't it? Because yeah. 0 is less than or equal to 1. So that one is allowed, that comes in addition. Of course, the other options, 1, 0, oh, oh, 0, oh, 1. 1, 1, 0 is also allowed. So this gives a little bit more. You're allowed not to start a project at all. Okay? See, this is what we use these binary variables for. Okay? We have to define them, and then we have to add some special constraints to make them work, so to speak. Okay, we will see those in many situations. They can be used to, to kind of define all kinds of le logic, like if, if something happens, then something else must happen. This kind of stuff is relatively easy to construct. If two things should happen at the same time, then you can look at something like this, where you multiply them. Of course, if one thing happens and the other happens not, then of course there will be zero times one, which is zero. And then you you're looking for the one here to kind of take care of the fact that things should happen together. Of course, this is a nonlinear constru construction, so then you have to do some tricks to kind of 
make it linear if you stick to the linear formulation. And this is important because much of the software tools which are available, they kind of works best at least if you look at linear problems. So we very often try to keep it linear. That's a point by itself. Okay, now that was the introduction. Let's look at the problem at hand. Now, recall our example. We had this K, which was the setup cost. So each time a setup happened, these costs came. Okay. And when we formulate a model now, we can kind of generalize a little bit. Okay. We can, for instance, allow for the setup cost to be different in future periods. Could that be interesting? Can you see what can happen then? This setup cost is related to the technology we have. Okay? It's kind of re related to the machines we use. So it, it's normally kind of starting up a machine. Okay? And if, for instance, we plan to change our technology, to buy a new machine, that would, one could behave differently. It could have a smaller setup cost, for instance. In many cases, we're interested in doing that. Trying to improve our technology to make it easier to start to produce different things. That would provide us with flexibility. That would hedge us against uncertainty, wouldn't it? So if it's cheaper for us to change the way we produce things, then we can react faster to the market, which is kind of an obvious thing. Suppose we arrange concerts, okay, and we have booked a certain artist. Unfortunately, this artist either gets sick or it's a drug abuse or whatever, okay? These things seem to happen. And of course, in those cases, you could like to be in a flexible position, be able to cancel this concert, hire another one, or whatever, okay? This is kind of what we're talking about here. So, to extend it slightly, let's just say that we allow these k to be time dispersed. So there could be different setup costs in different time periods. That's just a simple change. Of course, we can do the same thing with inventory cost, not perhaps neither realistic or not, but it kind of opens up for a certain more flexibility in our modeling structure. In this model we also introduce a third cost element, which we refer to as the production cost. As we might recall from our aggrega aggregated production planning problem, we had the production cost. And in most cases, we, 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 we would like to take that into account, even at the more operational level. Th there could be some, some kind of tuning there, which could be interesting to look at. So we kind of extend the example slightly. We keep the two cost elements we have. We make them time variable. And we also add a new time variable, fixed cost, referred to as the production cost. Okay, these are the data, if you like, to our model. Of course, we need a capital T here, a time horizon, to define how many periods our problem should work for. Then, let's look at variables. Obviously, Amount produced in various time periods is a variable here, isn't it? Oh, the single product. We were actually tuning that yesterday, and we were kind of changing this. We, in some periods, we produced 139, in other periods, we pr produced something else, de depending on what, on what kind of mechanism we used here. In the final silver and mill heuristic, we had a lot of different production volume. So obviously the production amount must be a variable here. There is uh, another data here. Should you write that? DT. Demand in period T. I forgot that. Sorry, Sorry about that. <coughs> of course these are also numbers put into our problem. So all, everything here is numbers basically. 
while here is variables. And then we need this one. We need the binary variable to tell us when we do the setups, okay? Because then we can kind of, to be able to, to calculate the total cost here, we actually need to know in which time periods there is a setup, okay? But as opposed to the previous example of the oil field, here we allow ourselves to have more than one setup in the whole period. Doesn't it? it could be one, it could be two, it could be actually up to the capital T. So we don't need this sum constraint here to make it work. So it is one if we produce in time period T. It's zero elsewhere. You can, you can look at the notation here. This is the typical way of writing this. Okay, let me just wash my fingers slightly. No. If I write this, are you able to tell me what this means? What is the logical conclusion of this little piece of mathematics? What does it mean? Of course, we can write it out. K1 times delta 1 plus K2 sorry, times delta 2 plus and so on. That's what it means. We just add together all these setup costs multiplied by the binary variables. What did you say, Jonas? The total setup cost. The total setup cost. Absolutely correct. This is the total setup cost. Okay, so you see now by these binary variables, we can just multiply with the cost element to the binary variable, and then add together to get the total setup cost. And of course, we want to minimize total cost, so this is an important uh, acknowledgement. So this is total setup cost. Okay. Okay, we need one speciality more here to make these run, okay? Let me take this out. So far, we have kind of defined our binary variable, say it should be 1 or 0, and now we have identified an expression which kind of constructs the total set of cost for us, given that this one actually is 1 if we produce. But the model doesn't know that yet, does it? Seen from the model point of view, we need some more logic to kind of, which works in the s sense that if our production in a certain period is positive, then this delta in the same period should be equal to 1, shouldn't it? We have to represent this type of logic to kind of bind the model together, to make the model understand how it should put 1s and zeros to these variables. And of course if xt is 0, meaning that we don't produce in that case, the delta t should be zero. So we need to construct a constraint, preferably a linear one, which secures that this logic is preserved. Again, knowing what to do here is something that comes by experience. There is actually a kind of nice textbook on how to do 
binary variable modeling. Uh, so if you're really interested in this, you can we can look at it. But uh, for the moment, I think we leave that. Okay, it's a kind of you can kind of build up a set of binary constructs based on general logic statements. Okay, a leads to b, a not b, and all these kinds. Of, so we can kind of transform classical logic into this way of thinking. So it's in principle it's possible to make a kind of automatic way of doing this. But in most practical cases we kind of stick to some knowledge here and in very few cases we, we kind of find up something, some new ways of doing this. So let's look at uh, a different construction and see how it works. Now I write that xt should be less than or equal to, and I introduce something new here, capital MT times delta T. Now this M here is a big number. This is a trick of course. And the reason is that uh, and you'll see the reason fairly soon now. Okay, let's uh, put something big into this. xt less than or equal to 100,000 times delta t. And see what happens now if we kind of vary the delta c t and see if we kind of get the correspondence with the, the x as we like it. Okay. Now if delta t is 1, in that case this constraint says xt should be less than or equal to a big number. So these kind of constraints over xt, but it allows it to be of any value, doesn't it? <coughs> so this allows for the fact that a positive xt gives a unity or a one value of the delta t. If on the other hand now the delta is zero, in that case this constraint says xt should be less than or equal to zero. At the same time, in all mathematical programming, we have the underlying constraint that xt should be larger than or equal to zero, and these two together forces the x to be zero. Okay, so you see here that if x is zero, we are not allowed to have a one value on the delta. If x is positive, then this one runs, and then we can then we get a, a force on the delta to be one. So this constraint here secures that this logic runs. Okay, that's the idea. And in each case we do this, we kind of have to make this happen. We have to make sure that the logic which kind of forces our binary variables to give ha to have the correct value must be present, typically by a set of added constraints. You can of course think about this reversely. If you look at this constraint, uh, the mark, marked star here, if x now has a positive value, say it's 10, then this is okay, isn't it? 10 is less than 100,000, so that's okay. <coughs> this one is not okay. A positive value is not smaller than or equal to zero. So, so a positive value is okay here, but not here. A zero value is okay here, but, but this one will then force the zero value through the fact that you have this one as well as this one added underlying. Okay. Do we need any more variables? Yes, perhaps we do. Take this out. Finally, we need inventory variables. We typically call them IT, a stored quantity 
by the end of period t. So again, of course, we have to make an assumption on when to measure inventory. In this case, we do it as simple as possible, just looking at the end inventory. Of course, we could have used average inventory here as well, uh, but uh, that will kind of ma make it tricky here in, in this setting. That it, it's, it's not impossible. The consequence of what we've talked so far is a mathematical programming model in the form of a linear program. So let me write it up, okay? Now, if you recall back on our previous linear program, there were no binary variables in that one. Okay? Here we have a binary variable, and in many cases it turns out that problems, which is a kind of combination between continuous and binary variables, are extremely much harder to solve than an ordinary linear program. I might try to explain why for you. Okay? When you have these binary variables, they kind of pop up. So you have some kind of space here where you it kind of goes like this. And this is of course in many dimensions. If you have continuous variables it's more like more like this in kind of many dimensions. And in these situations you can kind of use derivatives to get information on where you are. Where you should be to find these peaks. But here you cannot do that. So you're going to have to search through it. And if there's kind of no logic which in the problem which tells you that it's better to go in that direction than in that direction, then they are hard to solve. Then you have to search everything. And searching everything takes a lot of time here. Because there's an enormous amount of possibilities here. If you have 100 million binary variables, each taking 0, 1, there's a lot of potential searches to make. So that is the main reason why we very often tend to use a different name on these models. We tend to call them MIP models. So an MIP model is a linear programming model, but it has also integer variables. Some use the term MILP, mixed integer linear program, mixed integer program. So they kind of, there's a different naming here due to the fact that the solution behavior is very different in between standard linear programs only con containing continuous variables as opposed to these types which also has these binary variables. If you think about this it shouldn't be too hard should it? Because if you have a single binary variable you can I first put it to one and solve the remaining problem that produces one solution then put it to zero solve the remaining problem that produces the other one then you pick the best of them. So if the number of binary variables is small, then it's really not a problem. But the problem is that in most cases the number of binary variables are very large. We have to add and introduce a lot of these ver binary variables to kind of make the logic work. If we have more than one product, if there's a set of products, then we will have to have a binary variable linked to each of the product. If there's many time periods, if there's 40,000 products, 10,000 time periods, then it's 40,000 times 10,000 binary variables, which is a big number. Each of these could take two values, of course, searching through that would take years on a normal computer, even though normal computers are fast. So it's, it's basically very easy to construct a program here which has uh, qualities which a full, or which, what we often refer to as a full enumeration, that means kind of we search through everything. That takes too much time, basically. Okay, that was an attempt to try to explain graphically why these two problem classes are qualitatively different, in a sense. Okay. And, uh, yeah. We tend also to call these problems combinatorial optimization problems. And the, the term combinatorial comes to me as kind of we either do that or that. Okay, let's look at our objective. We want to minimize 
total costs and total costs here are first to sum up our setup costs which we already discussed that part and of course there may be some or actually is some inventory costs ht times it and then we added the ct didn't we which kind of is related to our production amount so each unit produced costs ct according to the definition here and then we need an inventory balance here we need to make sure that the amount on inventory is calculated correctly so the number we have at a certain time point is as before constructed by taking the previous amount add the produced amount and then subtract the demand as defined in this case we do not typically open up for in or outsourcing which of course we could have done as we did in the aggregate planning model but that is typically not the case here and then we have to add this one and there's one of these for all t in one up to t and the same here and of course we assume here that typically then we say that the delta is a binary variable by our construction like this or we could if you don't like to write everything we could say that it's just written like this to signal that it's a binary variable and of course we have this xt and it should be positive continuous variables we allow for any kind of number which are positive for these variables so this is a full specification or a so-called lot size model this is often called the single item lot sizing model or a simple lot size model due to the fact that we look at a, sing, sim, at an, a unique one product kind of thing we can i think we, we look at an extension to this model in one of the exercises where you open up for more than one product which of course is closer to reality here that model is very famous in logistics it's referred to as a clsp problem capacitated lot size problem and of course if you have more than one product there is a certain production capacity at a certain time point you can kind of you can't kind of produce outside of that so that limits your production you can produce more of one product and less of another okay that imposes difficulties when solving it this model i think it's been written tens of thousands of articles just on this model here how to solve it uh, the most famous attempt was done in the 50s, I think, by two guys named Wagner and Wittin, who constructed a specialized algorithm based on dynamic programming. You don't know what dynamic programming is, perhaps? No. So we don't, then we don't spend time. The point is that it runs very fast. It runs in so-called polynomial time. Have you heard about these concepts? No. Perhaps not. No, it doesn't matter. But it runs fast. Uh, we attempt to use a more classical way to kind of solve it as a mathematical program using standard software. But be aware of the fact that uh, there is uh, algorithms far more efficient than a standard algorithm used by a standard solver. You probably recall that when we discussed linear programming, we discussed briefly the simplex algorithm. The idea then was that we had this constraint space and we can argue that the solution must be one of the corner points uh, should we say the typical algorithm which kind of resembles this one when it comes to mixed integer programs is referred to as branch and bond the branch and bond algorithm is extensively utilizing the simplex principle and what you typically do then is that you kind of fix the binary variables so you say that some variables are 1, others are 0 and then you solve the resulting continuous linear programs by the simplex method then it, you use that information to move to the next step and so you kind of make a loop here where you at each stage s solve a lot of linear programs to kind of search through the space in a reasonably intelligent way we will not of course go into these algorithms you know, how they really work and what kind of complexities are involved but as i said it turns out here luckily for the researchers of course that 
this general algorithm, which kind of runs on every type of problem, has a lot of limitations when it comes to solving special structures on the problems. So these kind of special structure problems runs much better with a different approach. And that approach was uh, originally introduced by Walter and Wittin in, uh, in the 50s. But still today there is a lot of research going on these models, pro proposing new algorithms, analyzing them, comparing with old algorithms and so on. There's a lot of work done still on these matters here. But our main point here is to understand this binary variable concept. I think that's the most important so far. Okay, then I think it's a good time for a break. So let's take a break and meet in 15 minutes.